What was really going on with Harry and Meghan's controversial Caribbean holiday? Should Prince Andrew remarry Sarah Ferguson? And does the royal health crisis mean the royals will reveal more personal information? Once again, we've got a very busy program for you. Hello and welcome to your favourite weekly royal show, Palace Confidential. I'm Jo Elvin and today joining me is the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, the paper's editor-at-large, Richard Kay, and the Mail's diary editor, Richard Eden. Welcome, fantastic trio. Now, a reminder to all our viewers that if you like great royal updates every week, then make sure that you press that subscribe button and never miss another episode. Right, lots to get through, let's not muck around. We're going to start though with an update on the health of the King and the Princess of Wales. Rebecca, I believe you know everything. What's the latest? Well, that's really lovely of you, Joe. but I have to say, <laughs> update is slight, slightly optimistic at the moment. Um, I had a chat with Buckingham Palace the other day and they said, look, we're not going to tell you when the king is going to go in because understandably they want to keep it as private as they can not just for him but obviously other patients that the hospital is going to go to but we will let you know as uh, as soon as we've got you know the operation has been successful we haven't heard anything yet um ditto with the princess of wales however yesterday i was actually walking to a medical appointment myself and uh, Prince William sped past me, actually going to visit her at hospital. I like so, this story. Were you dressed <laughs> as a nurse at the time, carrying flowers? No, I genuinely was on my way uh, to um, a surgical procedure myself. Oh, and I, I hope was like, oh, all right. right, yeah, no, no, it's all yeah. fine. Um, but he drove past me. And I've, I've actually seen quite a lot of conjecture online because he hasn't been seen visiting her. Is he going to see her? What's going on? Which is really <laughs> unfair. And actually, the, whole, the reason why you haven't seen him is because the media have agreed not to have photographers down, they're not to have camera crews, not to have journalists, to allow her to recuperate from her operation in privacy and also, you know, respect the privacy of the other patients at the hospital. But as I say, I saw him with my own eyes speed past, so I know he's going to see her. Aww. And I know that means she's still obviously in hospital at the Did moment. Did you give him a little wave? No, I was, <laughs> I was so taken <laughs> aback. <laughs> oh, now, they do say, don't they, that things come in threes, and now we've had a news of a third royal health issue, well, a crisis, really, as the Duchess of York is also unwell. Yeah, I think we're all really sad to, to hear this, but a, a very much like a breast cancer diagnosis. I mean, it's, it's very lucky that it's been caught. So she announced at the weekend that she'd been diagnosed with a malignant melanoma, which actually is a very serious form of skin cancer, I know, because I've had it in my own family. Um, and it was caught because she was going in for further reconstructive surgery after her, her breast cancer and her mastectomy. And the dermatologist was really on the button and said, there's some things that I'm not quite happy about. Can we get them checked out? And I was told by a friend of hers, she found out over the new year that, that it was cancer, but she's going to have to go some other investigations to make sure they have got everything out. But I know the doctors are very hopeful they, ha they have. So, And she's, she's determined to get back on television screens again to again use as another personal crisis, health crisis as a means to encourage other people to get themselves checked out and, and hopefully save lives as well. Yeah, I mean, melanoma is one of those sort of silently scary, uh, really malicious diseases. I hope she's doing well. But Richard, as Rebecca alludes to, it's going to slow down hopes for that media career to take off. But it's also been widely reported that Sarah's been keeping an eye on Prince Andrew, who's had his share of problems. Well, obviously, Prince Andrew's been going through a difficult time recently. You know, he doesn't have a job anymore. And we've had all the revelations from those court documents in America. So she's been supporting him. At the same time, remember, she's only recently um, you know, recovered from her cancer treatment and she started working very hard. She's become the sort of breadwinner of the family, so to speak, and she's been doing all sorts of TV appearances and she's working with her books and that sort of thing. So it has come at a, a terrible time for her. Mm. Um, but uh, you know what she's like? I think having, um, she's already been to a, a clinic in Austria to uh, convalesce. And I'm sure she'll be kind of back at it before, before too long. She's one of those people, you just sort of nothing will keep her down. She's definitely got to just get on with it spirit. She, she really um, has. Speaking of that, Richard Kay, this leads me very nicely to a piece you wrote this week for the Mail's new subscription platform, Mail Plus, that in intrigued me greatly. You have a novel solution 
Well, for uh, the uh, it's not an original solution. Uh, the idea is that maybe one way of out of uh, the Duke and Duchess's current uh, predicament uh, would be for them to remarry because that would at least give Andrew, I think, some sort of public validation that at least there's someone who's, who is very much standing by him. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it, might also, it might also deal with the issue over housing. Would he, is he really going to be able to stay on in, in Royal Lodge if he and uh, Fergie were to become uh, a married couple once again? Uh, that might de deter some of the enemies within the court who would like to evict him from that property. I mean, as I say, it's, it's not original. We've been down this road many times before, but the fact is they have been together for the best part of, of 40 years. I think we're coming up next year to the anniversary, 40th anniversary of when they first met, uh, although they knew each other as children. And, and despite divorce, despite all the difficulties and the embarrassments that Fergie heaped on the royal family and indeed Andrew, they have remained together. Now, would it be though a marriage of rekindled love or a marriage of convenience? Uh, that's a very good point. I suspect more or more of the latter. I mean, I think there is a, a great deal of affection between the two of them still. Um, neither of them have, have found anyone else they want to make their life partner. I think there are various issues, of course, raised there. Um, one, one thing which I didn't touch on but which has occurred to me is if she were to marry and remarry Andrew, would she get her HRH back? Um, I suspect <laughs> not. Wow. Um, but it was taken away from her when she divorced him. What, what are your memories as a young reporter? Because you were at <sighs> their wedding. Well, well yeah, yeah. I wasn't, actually, I wasn't that young. <laughs> but I, was, I was covering the... Are you I a did vampire, cover the Richard? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. See my picture in the attic. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I, I remember it being a, an incredibly hot but very joyful day. I mean, London really was en fête just as it had been five years earlier with, with Charles and Diana's wedding, but there was something intrinsically different this time because here was a couple who were manifestly very much in love. And it was one of the reasons why no one has really grasped why they ever split up. But they were in love, clearly. They, they couldn't keep their hands off one another um, when they were out together in public. And they, they seemed a team, a, a proper team. And by then, tragically, uh, Charles and Diana w were no longer really much of a team. And, and so I think there was an awful lot invested in, in um, Andrew and Fergie, and there were great hopes for the future, but sadly, they all dissipated within two or three years. Do you know what I remember about Andrew and Fergie's wedding? My cat died that night. Oh. Oh, we, were, we were in Australia watching it in the middle of the night live. Well, I, I was actually there too, not, not as a um, reporter in the Abbey, but a page boy. As, a, as, a, as a child in the Bay crowds in, in the Mall. Yeah. And Why afraid, am I not surprised? <laughs> I was, um, I'm afraid, Budding diarist even then, Richard. <laughs> I, I was so short that my memory of the day is using a periscope. So everything I saw of the carriages rushing past was through this little periscope. Oh, to did see you have your crowds. little Union Jack hat on? I, I may have done. We were there with some friends visiting from Canada. So, um, yeah, no, it was, a, it was a great day. I love that. I love that. We need, I need photos. We need <laughs> next week the montage of Richard Eden <laughs> and Andrew short, and Sarah's yeah. wedding. Um, but what do you think? You know, we've, uh, royal weddings always a boost for the economy, a boost for morale. But what what would a royal re-wedding be like? How would that be received? Well, the, the, you know, the, the mind boggles. But remember, we've had um, register office weddings before, of course, with our king, King Charles and Camilla, got married at Windsor Register Office, and they had a service of blessing afterwards. So there's no reason why. Um, Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, might not have a service of blessing for... Just um, nip round to the garden Andrew. again? Well, it might be a backyard ceremony <laughs> like it was, you know, for <laughs> Harry and Meghan a, yeah. a few days earlier. Yeah. So he's available for all these kind of um, ceremonies. So, <laughs> I, yeah, I think why not have a party again? I mean, may, maybe not. I'm not sure we'll have crowds in the mail, frankly, but it, it could be, you know, maybe a few crowds that outside Windsor register office. Don't pretend you wouldn't be there with your <laughs> periscope again. Well, come on, the guest list would be great, wouldn't it? Who, who would be on that guest list? Oh my gosh, Rebecca, you know the Duchess a bit. You, well, probably more than a bit. If you were a very close friend of hers, what would you advise her? Run. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, flippantly, but 
I'm not sure it, it would be good for either of them, I have to say. Then they'd be really entwined together, and if things ever go wrong, they're both going to get pulled down, aren't oh, where's they? Where's your so... sense of romance? Come on. <laughs> I'm well, not the well, most romantic type the moment, anyway, Rebecca, Richard. They're but... pretty down, aren't they? Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> There's that... only one way, and it's up. That, that's true. I mean, obviously, the, there is a friendship there, isn't there, that, that yeah. clearly gives them both comfort and to be fair they've been great parents you know their their daughters are a real credit to them so they've done something right i'm not sure they need to go and a little bit further and kind of put an official stamp on it but let's remember that they've been acting you know like a married couple for for years i mean i remember rebecca you know revealing a great story that they bought a, a swiss ski chalet together this was years ago it's since been sold you know as well as living together at windsor so they've really they're almost like a married couple now, aren't they? Actually, it just reminded me, my young son saw the story I'd written about Fergie this week, and he said, he couldn't pronounce Fergie, he said, like, who's this Fergus woman? And I said, well, she's Prince Andrew's ex-wife, but they still live together. And he just looked at me and went, why? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Prince Philip. He always kept saying, why? You see, oh the children gosh. say it as they see it, don't they? Uh, well, look, see, let's be, be serious for a minute, because obviously Richard Kay, after both Sarah's cancer diagnoses. She's used the opportunity to raise awareness of those conditions, breast cancer, skin cancer, and the king seemingly, or at least, you know, followed her lead when talking about his enlarged prostate. It seems unthinkable that this would have happened even 10 years ago. Well, I mean, it's, there's a kind of a myth going around that the royals never shared details about uh, their ailments. I mean, I remember when both the queen and uh, qu her mother, the queen mother had, um, hip work in the Queen Mother's case and, and the Queen had knee problems and the, the palace were up front and explained what they were having done. I think we, we've been slightly uh, blindsided because uh, when Prince Philip was alive um, there was a lot of controversy when details of an ailment he had at the time was revealed and he took grave exception to it and, um, and said that his privacy had been invaded and, and ever since the palace then started getting very cautious about what they said about uh, royal ill health. And this has been a, quite a step change in this last couple of weeks with the revelations. I think they, they did learn a big lesson uh, after Queen Elizabeth when she had an overnight hospital stay and they not just kept it from us, they deliberately steered us in the wrong direction and then it emerged she had been. And there was a, a great deal of anger was saying if our head of state is we understand that she wouldn't tell us every appointment she goes to, but if mm. our head of state is overnight having hospital tests, um, really, we should know about it. Do you think, Richard Kay, that Diana uh, had any influence in this arena? You know, looking back, you were around when she was unsqueamish about her own health battles, and she was also very instrumental in changing the narrative around AIDS patients when she held an AIDS patient's hand, how was that received? Well, I guess that was slightly a slightly different issue. I mean, where, where Diana sort of uh, led, of course, was, as you say, in, in AIDS and public, uh, the public view of AIDS at the time um, was that it was, sort of, it was, they recognised that it was something like, they thought it was something like leprosy, you know, mm. it was sort of biblical, a plague almost. And um, Diana went some way to, to, re to, to reduce public concerns by openly touching AIDS patients, shaking their hands and so forth, and showing that it couldn't be contracted by mere touch. Um, the royals up until that point were extremely squeamish um, about mixing with people with ill health. Um, I remember Diana saying that when she first raised this topic with, with the Queen, the Queen sort of recoiled from the idea, well, why do you have to? Why do you have to get involved in something like that? And there are plenty of other nice things you could be doing, uh, like with animals. And, um, and her view was, well, well, we'll deal with the animals when we finish dealing with the humans. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she was very determined that she was going to sort of stick a flag on that particular ground. And it, and it obviously had a huge effect worldwide on public attitudes towards AIDS. And Camilla seems to have really taken that baton, hasn't she, Rebecca, with championing unfashionable causes. You've written about that this week. I have, yeah. I mean, obviously, I followed her work in the field of domestic violence and sexual abuse pretty much since I, I came on the job and she started. She got married to the then Prince of Wales and, and embarked on this. And I, and I, I really am very... I'm really very admiring of what she's done in this field. And it's not just me, it's the people that she dealt with and for 
the male plus this week I've interviewed Diana Parks whose daughter Joanna Simpson was murdered very brutally by her estranged husband a week before their divorce and her best friend Hetty who works for Refuge and uh, Camilla went on a, a kind of off the radar visit to one of their um, outreach centres this week and they both spoke to me and they are they are not people who give plaudits you know uh, they're quite sparing in what they say on this, um, but they say she has made a massive difference to the work they're doing in this field in helping other victims and survivors. And I think, you know, all credit to her because it wasn't one of the, the fluffy causes the royals would tend to adopt. Absolutely. And now you can read that piece and Richard Kay's piece about Fergie and Andrew by clicking the link below after the show. Uh, Richard Eden, you've written in your newsletter this week, following on from this, that the Princess of Wales is now facing calls to reveal what, why she's in hospital. Yes, I mean, there's been, I've been quite alarmed really, over the course of the past week, there have been more and more sort of calls for her to give more details. Obviously the statement that Kenston Palace um, put out was just that it was um, planned abdominal surgery. They didn't go into any details. And that was in contrast with the statement that Buckingham Palace put out about the King's um, problems, um, which went into more detail. But since then, there have been lots of people saying, particularly online, it's sort of come across as bullying, really. Mm. It's been, you know, she should give more details. Why doesn't she? And there's been more pressure. There's even been letters, letters to the Times newspaper for really? saying that it would be a great example to other women if um, she was to be more open about her medical problems and this sort of thing. And, it's made me very uncomfortable and I think that, um, that there's no reason why she should feel kind of bullied into giving more details. If she wants to at a later point, fine, that's, that's up to her. But she shouldn't feel that she has to. Yeah, and Rebecca, we're obviously no one here is suggesting that, she, that Catherine should feel the need to talk about it. But unfortunately, as, as Richard touches on, you know, in this era of social media, I just feel like there's a possibility that speculation is not going to go away. It's not, but I 100% agree with Richard, and this is something I think Kensington Palace should, and I know they will stick to their guns over. You know, they've been probably more open, I would say, than they would normally be, and that's because of the length of time that she'll be out of the public eye for, and they feel they need to explain it to a certain extent. But it's her right to, to decide whether she shares it or not. And they've said to me, look, we don't know whether she will, but it, it's really up to her at some point. And at the moment, her focus is on getting better and also trying to keep life as normal as, as she can for her three children. Do you think, do you think people really think it's a, it's a good social initiative or they just really just want to know what it is that the nosiness is getting the better of them? I think it is, yeah. Mm. And I think, it, I think it was quite awkward that the two statements issued the same afternoon did take different approaches. You know, it is an argument, it has to be said, for having a much more unified kind of press office and everything. Mm. You know, it, there's no logic there in giving lots of details about one member of the royal family and not about the other. I think that, that was a, a mistake. It's interesting. You see, I disagree, but I think, but again, it was a personal decision for the king to be open about it because he felt what's happening to him was, was something that is so common. I think as we discussed on the programme last week, you know, it affects one in three men of his age. So he wanted to be quite open about mm. that and that was his choice to do so. And the timing was unfortunate, but he'd literally only got his diagnosis that day and was having to cancel engagements for the next day. So they just had to, you know, put the information out there pretty quickly. I mean, the palace admitted to me, look, this is not ideal. We're being slightly bombarded with medical information about the royals on one day, but we've not really got a lot of choice about this. Mm. Well, we'll be discussing a controversial trip to the Caribbean from a certain pair in just a moment. But before that, some of your comments now. And S. Balmer writes, the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh have replaced Harry and Meghan, and we are far better off with them. Edinburgh fans like S. Balmer, you are in luck because we'll have more on Edward and Sophie a little bit later in the show. Meanwhile, Captain Jennifer, aye, aye, Captain, had this to say, thank you for highlighting Prince William travelling to present the awards to Rob Burrow and Kevin Sinfield. These two friends have shown such a commitment to living life with such a debilitating illness, a royal recognition well deserved. And a comment now from our extended interview with Robert Hardman that we aired on Monday. And head back to watch that after this if you missed it. Margaret McGill was a fan of the moving story about Princess Anne on the day that the late Queen died. I love the story about the Princess Royal and the hug. Chuckled out loud with tears in my eyes. 
Finally, Francis Meyer quotes Shakespeare, namely King Lear, when talking about the king and Prince Harry. Now, can I just say, no Australian should ever attempt to say anything Shakespearean. This is just going to be hideous in my accent. However, how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have thankless child. <laughs> King Lear, Act 1, Scene 4. Very much triggered for my final year of school there. Uh, keep, please keep those comments coming up. We love to hear your thoughts and your questions. We love them all. Sticking with the Sussexes now and the pair touched down in Jamaica this week for a visit that has caused controversy from the start. Rebecca, most seem to be upset at the comparisons that made that made between this trip and the visit that William and Catherine made in 2022. Yes, uh, and obviously they were attending uh, One Love, which is uh, a new biopic of Bob Marley. It was a, a premiere in Kingston, and they were, well, to everyone there, it was a complete surprise that they turned up, um, seemingly the guest of, of, of Paramount Pictures. Um, but one of the most controversial moments was them posing on the red carpet with the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Andrew Holness, who, of course, back in 2022, when I was there with them on their big trip of the Caribbean, uh, they were due to meet him and have private bilateral talks. And they were just meant to be standing there posing for a kind of photograph. And he took that opportunity to say very publicly, we want to move on from the British monarchy, which is absolutely his right and will be very well supported in Jamaica. But there were lots of people at the time that felt it was a little bit grandstanding, it was a little bit showboating, and obviously them as guests were a little bit awkward and slightly embarrassed about it. And obviously Harry and Meghan greeting Holness Wardley on the car warmly on the red carpet and posing with him. And there was quite a bit of sneering online, look how, how much more relaxed he is with Harry and Meghan, those are the royal escapees. Uh, rather than, than William and Kate. It was, yeah, it, it's got a bit nasty, I have to say. What, what do you think's going on there, Richard Kay? There's the, you know, the old real, the real politics saying is, my enemy's enemy is my friend. Is that what's going on? Is, is Harry having a subtle dig at his brother there or is actually the Prime Minister of Jamaica doing the same? I think that's a delicious idea, but I, I suspect not. Um, I think one of the uh, questions which, which is thrown up by this trip is, is why did Harry and Meghan accept the invitation in the first place. What did they think they would achieve by being there? Harry, after all, went to Jamaica. I think, Rebecca, you were there 10, 12 years ago, yeah. and it was a famous photograph on a red carpet with another uh, Republican-minded Prime Minister who also wanted to terminate the links with the monarchy. And uh, that went down terribly well at the time. Harry uh, seemed to really touch a chord, not just with the public in Jamaica, but throughout the Commonwealth and particularly back here. Um, is he deliberately trying to um, provoke his family? No, I don't think so, because I think he's desperately trying to rebuild bridges with them. Um, but it does throw up an intriguing question, why was he there? Uh, is he really such a fan of, of Bob Marley? I do recall that on that trip in 2011, he met uh, the Marley family. Um, and so, danced with them. And danced with them, yeah. and so there, 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 there is a link. But, but I wonder what he took with him as, for, as part of his travel kit this week, because some years ago I was in Jamaica when the King, then the Prince of Wales, um, famously donned, and this would now be called cultural appropriation, a wig, a Rastafarian wig. Right. And we were in Trenchtown, we were at the site of where Bob Marley had lived, and um, the King did a little twirl, and he was also given two mini cut down uh, wigs for Harry and William. I wonder if Harry still got that. Ah. Was that, yeah. Richard, was that the one that was known as the hat tour? Yeah. It's like legendary mythical yeah. status in, in royal reporting terms that everywhere the Prince of Wales then went, he was given a hat to wear and he was so annoyed by the end he of was. it. Yeah. He was absolutely brilliant. He included yeah. a huge resplendent uh, headdress of feathers when we were in the Ghanaian <laughs> rainforest. And then, of course, by the time he got back, he found himself under attack for cultural appropriation. And all he was trying to do was accommodate the photographers well, who wanted him to put a hat on. There's yeah. me Googling for the rest of the afternoon. Can't <laughs> wait. It's, it's a mythical status <laughs> in royal reporting terms, this trip. But, Richard Eden, there have been a few questions raised about the trip, and mainly about the timing and Harry and Meghan's lack of comments on a certain couple of other topics. I find everything about this trip just damn right weird. I mean, look, I, I thought Harry was an eco-campaigner. You know, he set up Travelist, all about sustainable travel. But then they're going, making a round trip of 6,000 miles from Montecito to 
um, Jamaica for um, a film premiere. What's that about? Very strange. And, you know, why are they there? They're there as the guests of a Paramount boss. I thought they were paid millions by Netflix. I mean, if they were going to some Netflix premiere or something, you might say, oh, yeah, it's all part of that. This is Paramount. What this suggests to me is that that Netflix deal might be coming to an end. Yes, they you might think be, they're hedging their bets? Yeah, I think they might be sort of showing a bit of leg to... Um, to Paramount, which, showing a bit of leg, you know, which what a has, phrase. <laughs> which, which is another very powerful network, and and yes, we haven't heard anything in public about um, you know his father who's in hospital this week or his sister-in-law, Catherine. Um, so they haven't used any of that, but their cheerleaders have been very quick to highlight the significance of this, and you know it's them as the alternative royals, them as the you know aligning themselves with. With Republicans. I mean, remember that Queen Elizabeth appointed them, they were key to the Commonwealth. They were seen as, you know, really ambassadors for the future and everything. But then when they made their Netflix series, it was all about how awful the Commonwealth is and in its extension of the empire yes, and this well, sort of no, thing. I remember when they got engaged, Meghan very excited about visiting the Commonwealth countries. Yes. She had them embroidered into her veil. Yeah. For her wedding. Um, um, so everything about it just, just jars with me. Richard Kay, we've had award ceremonies, living legends of aviation, film premieres, <laughs> you know, but we, we're still none the wiser as to what their actual work is going to entail. What are, what are their work plans? Has anyone told you? No one's told me. And indeed, <laughs> what, are, what are their life plans? I mean, what are they doing with themselves? As Richard says, they're sort of rather aimless at the moment. They don't seem to have a clear strategy. Um, is it to, to rebuild bridges with Britain or, and particularly with the royal family? Or is it to, to pursue a narrow commercial agenda? Um, we, we simply don't know. And I think striking out, as Richard said, on a trip from California all the way uh, to the Caribbean seems an extraordinary exercise. Mm. Well, Rebecca, we were discussing engagements, weren't we, that might have made the royal family of old wince a bit. And then now the Duchess of Edinburgh has been doing just that. Yeah, Dasha Edinburgh, and actually her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, I've written about them both for, um, for the paper this week. Um, so the Dutch of Edinburgh yesterday was at a school in East Dulwich in South London. Uh, That's talking, my neck of the woods. I missed it. Uh, not far yeah. from me, actually. Yeah. Um, and uh, she was talking about uh, periods, and there's a big campaign by an organisation she's involved with, Wellbeing of Women, called Just a Period, to kind of get away from the idea of period shame and, and embarrassment about seeking help for young girls. And actually there were some young young students, uh, male students, also in the meeting. Um, but she was really open and answering every, you know, question that was being asked of her, you know, some of her most kind of embarrassing moments or awkward moments herself involved administration. And I just, I just, Certainly when I was starting this job, that is 100% something you would have never heard them talking yes, about. Yes, I imagine the Queen um, might have recoiled at that as well, along with... I don't think anyone would have yeah. dared ask her. <laughs> I mean, I say good on her. I thought, I oh, thought, I thought, it, was, yeah. I thought it was great. Um, and also, actually, Prince Edward, um, her husband's actually out on a two-day trip to South Africa and on to St Helena. Uh, this week, and uh, it's a story I think only I did. I think only the, only I spotted it. But he gave a kind of question and answer session when he was in Pretoria, and uh, again said quite extraordinarily, he said, uh, "Look, I feel a bit embarrassed about standing up here as a man because I don't think men are doing a very good job with the world at the moment, referring to you know conflicts that are, are going on globally." And uh, he said, "Yeah, we're basically making a bit of a hash of it." And again, you know, I thought, well. Quite outspoken, Edward, but a really good talking point. Were you surprised at that, Richard Kay? I, I was rather, because he was really manifestly making the point that men were were behind uh, the war in Ukraine, the, the 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 crisis in the Middle East, which I suppose they almost certainly are. Um, he didn't actually offer any solution. He wasn't suggesting that it was time for women to come forward. But perhaps that's the hidden message there. Mm. I don't know, uh, Richard. Do you think? in this monarchy, we might see Edward and Sophie exploring new areas when it comes to their roles. Well, at the moment, obviously, we've got three out of four of the most senior members of the royal family out of action. So it is a great chance for, you know, the um, more junior members like Edward and Sophie to shine. And um, hopefully on this programme, we'll feature their work over the next few months. And I think it has been great the way that they um, have taken on some of the less fashionable causes. You know, Sophie's been very much involved in um, 
women as a victim of war and um, sexual crime and that sort of thing um, around the world. She's been involved in that. And obviously, um, Prince Edward's inherited um, the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme from his father, which is fantastic. So it, it'd be great if um, you know, the general public gets to hear more about their good work. They never really seem to get in trouble, do they? Well, I guess well. this, uh, <laughs> this no. week's the closest oh, okay. he's getting. Yeah. I, I think maybe he's taking over from Prince Philip. He wants to have a bit of a, yeah. you know, controversial statements or gaffes, as we like to call them. Why did you pull that face? Well, because they were spec in spectacular trouble, what, only a couple of decades ago. Oh, I wasn't <laughs> um, born. That's why I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah. they both were pursuing uh, quite uh, assiduously commercial activities which were inconsistent with being members of the royal family. But, you know, they drew a line under it and they've remodelled themselves and they've done a very good job. OK. If well. only there was someone that could learn from that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's not just the Sussexes causing a stir in Jamaica. The royal family have a long history with the Caribbean, both in their work as heads of state, but also holidaying on the likes of Mystique. How lovely. Here are some fantastic and Sussex-free pictures of the family in the Caribbean. Wonderful pictures there. Well, as always, subscribe to our channel for more great royal content every week. Thank you to Rebecca, the two Richards, and to you for watching. Bye for now. See you next week.